Good evening, everyone. Can everyone hear me OK in the room? Awesome. Uh, my name is Jamie Fitch. I'm the town sustainability manager. Thank you all for joining us this evening for our public meeting um, for our first um, or I should say our first public meeting for our vulnerability assessment. Um, in a few minutes, I will turn things over to the town's consultants from GEI. Um, but first, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping things. Um, first, for those joining us in the room, restrooms are out, out the door, down the hallway, and on your left. Um, we, uh, this will be a fairly informal uh, evening. Um, Leela Pike from GEI is going to give a presentation kind of introducing you all to the process um, for the vulnerability assessment, introducing some terminology and how uh, her team is working through looking at our infrastructure and our sea level rise projections and storm surge projections and taking all of that information to kind of give us a prioritized list of um, projects that the town should be thinking about for the future. Um, you're welcome to ask questions during the presentation. Um, Leela will re uh, repeat the question so that those um, listening online will be able um, to hear the question as well. Um, if, if you came in, um, before you leave, if you wouldn't mind just um, signing in at the back, there's a sign-in sheet on the table just so that we um, have an idea of how many people are with us this evening. Um, the sign-in sheet also includes your, a spot for your email address, that's optional, but we'll try to send out um, project updates and things like that for people who do give us email addresses. Um, and also on the back table, if you're interested, I just wanna share that we've got two other um, things happening um, related to sustainability and conservation. The first is um, the town's also in the process of developing an open space plan. We're looking for uh, community feedback for that plan. So there's a postcard on the back table with some information on how you can submit um, your feedback for that plan. Um, please check that out. And the website also has a lot of information about what that plan all entails. Um, and then we are also coordinating in, con in partnership with the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, an event called a coastal meetup. And that is a way for residents to um, become trained in how to document changing tides over time. So um, that event is happening on Thursday, um, what month are we in? August 22nd at 2 p.m. <laughs> um, at the Pine Point Eastern Trail parking lot. Um, and so there is a, a handout on the back table for how you can register that for that event if you're interested in learning how to collect tide data, um, which is very much related to our vulnerability assessment um, and helping us and the Gulf of Maine Research Institute um, compile uh, photos, so photo documentation over time. Um, so there's more information about that on the, the back table as well. Um, so again, thank you all for being here this evening. For folks online, if you do have questions throughout the, um, the evening, just raise your hand or type them in the chat um, or in the question and answer box. Um, if you would like to ask your question directly, you can raise your hand. If you would prefer that I ask your, the question on your behalf, you can just um, type your question in the box and um, I'll ask it on your behalf. Um, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Leela to take things away. Great, and I'm gonna share my screen. Let's see. Okay, hide that. Great, all right. Here we are. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. My name is Leela Pike. I am joined by my colleague, Elon Gasco, and we are here to tell you about the flood vulnerability project that we're working on for the town of Scarborough. We have only recently started this project, so this presentation will be more of an introduction to the project and what you can expect and some background on flooding and sea level rise and storm surge. And there will be a series of other presentations throughout this process over the next 10 months or so. So you'll have more opportunity to learn more about results and recommendations during those meetings. There's a lot that we're covering and I am very aware that these presentations can be somewhat boring. So please stop me to ask a question so that we can shake things up. Um, we will be going over the project, the goals of the project, recent flooding that the town has experienced, the coastline in Scarborough, 
how we are determining flood exposure in this study. So some background on sea level rise, storm surge, and the flood scenarios we will be using. What infrastructure will we be looking at for flood risk? An introduction to adaptation and then some next steps for this project. So the goals. First and foremost, oh, Pete. Uh, so first and foremost, the goals, uh, and the biggest goal of this project is to understand the coastal flood risk. So coastal flood risk would be flooding due to storm surge, sea level rise, astronomical high tides or king tides, or any combination of those events. And it's really a planning level study as opposed to a detailed coastal modeling analysis. So we are taking a broad brush stroke throughout the entire town for many scenarios of flooding with the hope and goal to prioritize infrastructure for flood adaptation so that the town can increase its resiliency to flood risk. So we will be looking at roads, buildings, pump stations, fire hydrants, manholes, culverts, a ton of infrastructure and many flood scenarios. And after we prioritize infrastructure for adaptation, so for example, focus on these five roads, these other five assets, prioritize adapting those first, these other, these other things you can wait until later on to, add, to adapt. We will be providing an overview of adaptation recommendations that could be elevate this road, relocate this road, abandon this road, and some and some relative costs for each of those options. For a few of these at-risk pieces of infrastructure, we will be diving deeper into adaptation and providing some concept level designs for what adapting that piece of infrastructure could look like. Throughout all this, we will be doing community engagement. And before I leave this slide, we'll talk about the photo there. So that's flooding at Route 1 during one of the events this past year. There is a separate project looking at, with Maine DOT, elevating Route 1 and Route 9 for adapting it to flooding and resizing or um, adding new crossings still being decided. That is a separate project. GEI is also working on that project. This presentation is not about that project, but you might see our names for other meetings, just to clear that up before it gets confusing. Okay, so here is a reminder of what some of the flooding looked like this past year. And I also wanna say that this project was in development before any of these storm events happened. So this project is not in response to the recent flooding. Coincidentally, this recent flooding occurred while we were in discussions about this project. So here's Higgins Beach for January 13th. January 13th was the highest water level recorded at the Portland NOAA tide gauge since it started recording water level in 1912. So you can see there's somebody who's almost in waist deep water. This, there was a lot of wave action, but, but where that person is standing, a lot of that flooding is just that is just the level of the water. And you can see the aftermath of some of that storm damage. So because of wave action, there was uh, quite a bit of damage there at Higgins. Another location where there was quite a bit of flooding, Pine Point Road, so that road was blocked off. There were actually many roads, as I'm sure you are all aware, that were blocked off during these events. And the reason for that is because the coastline of Scarborough is huge when you consider the marsh. So I wanna just show you a picture of the marsh. There is a flood inundation boundary on here. The point of this slide is not to show you what would be flooded. Um, this boundary represents highest astronomical tide or a king tide event with 0.8 feet of sea level rise. 
Really what I want to show you here is just the extents of the tidal impact felt in the marsh. It goes well beyond Route 1. It goes well beyond Payne Road. You can be miles away from the sandy beaches in Scarborough and still feel the impact of flooding from storms and sea level rise. So that is one reason that there are many roads that were shut off, cut off during these storm events. And then not to forget about the coastline in Scarborough that's actually getting that heavy wave action. And I know that you are all likely familiar with this. I look at maps every single day. My husband is somebody who never looks at maps. And so in case you're one of those people, I'm just orienting you to what your town looks like from a bird's eye view. So the western coast, west of the mouth of the Scarborough River, we have Pine Point, dunes, sandy beaches, pretty low lying. Across the mouth of the river, we have Barry Beach, my personal favorite beach in Scarborough. Prout's Neck over to Scarborough Beach with Massacre Pond um, right behind that. And then as you go east, you get to Higgins Beach, which is at the mouth of the Spurwink River. So flood exposure. How will we be determining what is exposed to flooding in the town? We will be looking at sea level rise, two different rates of sea level rise, intermediate and high rates, and we'll be talking about that next. We will also be looking at storm events, storm surge. The 10%, 2%, 1%, and 0.2% annual chance coastal storm that those events are sometimes referred to as the 100-year storm or the 500-year storm or 10-year storm. The 1% annual chance storm is what we most often come across. That is what FEMA's flood insurance maps are based on. The results from this study will look different from FEMA's study. Uh, FEMA doesn't include sea level rise. FEMA includes wave action, we will be looking at wave action a little bit differently than FEMA does. Um, that event, that 1% annual chance event, translates to an event that has a 1% chance of happening every year. That event could happen every single year. Um, it could happen once every 100 years is what is typically thought of as that storm, but we are seeing that happen more frequently than that. We will also be including the observed January 13th water surface elevation in this study um, because that is something that we have experienced. And then we are also looking at different time horizons. So near term, which would be present day or by 2030, medium term by 2050, long term by 2100. Sea level rise. So this graph is was produced by NOAA from the latest sea level rise projections from the International Panel of Climate Change, among other agencies. And we have it zoomed in to look between 2020 and 2100. There are five rates of sea level rise on here, ranging from a low rate of sea level rise up to a high rate of sea level rise. And with each of those rates, there's also a band of uncertainty and that band of uncertainty grows larger as you get farther in the future. So we are much less certain about what sea level rise will be in 2100 than we are about what it will be in 2030 or 2040. So the state of Maine, the Maine Climate Council, has, has provided some recommendations for what communities should look at when adapting for sea level rise. And they have said, please commit to managing an intermediate rate of sea level rise. However, they're saying be prepared to actually experience a high rate of sea level rise. And this is important and mainly because sea level is not just incrementally increasing every year or every month. Some months we have a high sea level, higher than we've ever seen before. January of 2024, the average 
sea level for that month was the highest we have ever seen, which was one of the reasons that we had that, that flooding. There was a high sea level on top of an astronomically high tide on top of a storm surge event. So it was the trifecta. Some months we'll see low, low levels of sea level, lower than um, the lowest rate of sea level rise projection. So it bounces up and down. And so that's why it's important when thinking about adaptation to look at, um, to expect to see some high, some months or periods of time where the seas are higher. For this study, we are including five future rates of sea level rise. One in 2030, the intermediate and the high rate of sea level rise in 2030 were very close to each other, so we just used one value, 0 0.8 feet. In 2050, we're looking at 1.5 and 1.9 feet, and in 2100, 4 feet and 7.4 feet. Yes? Oh, this might be a time when I call on Pete, who's sitting next to you. <laughs> yes, so the question is, what makes the sea level fluctuate month to month? Uh, hi, <laughs> sitting right next to you, one of my people. My name is Peter Slavinsky. I'm uh, one of the co-authors for the scientific detective of the Santa Fe report on sea level rise for the state of Maine. Um, so there are various things that influence sea level rise on a long term and a short term basis. In the long term, we're talking about influence on land levels, ice sheets. Shorter term scale, the things that are typically influenced are honestly on a day to day basis can vary based on the wind patterns. So, I'm sorry, what did you say what did that do? What the wind patterns are doing. Okay. So, we can have higher sea level when we have onshore winds, we have lower sea level when we have strong offshore winds. So, typically, sea levels in Maine actually vary to, they're higher in the summer months than they are in the winter months because of that pattern. But then we are punctuated by these very, very strong storm events that drive sea levels higher. Back in January and in the first five to six months of this year, and in eight months of 2023, we saw abnormally high sea levels. Um, and that probably, we still don't know why 100%, but that's probably due to, number one, um, a possible slowdown in the Gulf Stream. So the way water is moving along the coastline, when the, when the Gulf Stream slows down because of warmer ambient temperatures around it, sea levels can actually rise along the east coast of the United States. And um, the second thing associated with that is uh, the way pressure systems set up over Greenland and the Asian Islands. So that'll cause weak onshore flow against the east coast of the United States, and we'll see sea levels higher because of that. So on average, we've been seeing sea levels of about between 0.4 and 0.6 feet higher than they were in 2000. In 2023 and 2020. Hey, Pete. It can fluctuate back down, but for most months, we're setting records or records or close to records every month of the year. Thanks, Pete. I just wanted to make sure that the mic is on when you're speaking into it, because we got a comment. Hmm? It was green. It was green. Okay. So maybe just hold it a little bit closer to your mouth next time. That's, that's that sounds better. Thank you. Chan. Uh, yes, that, that is correct, and it has to do with the way the jet stream mostly sets up. Um, when the jet stream sets up, goes across country and dips south, um, you get steering patterns that actually steer storms up the coast. That can influence local sea levels um, versus when the jet stream comes straight across, comes across the United States, and most of the pressure systems actually will move off the coast, uh, and then therefore sea levels will be higher. So, yeah, but that also relates to the way the pressure system set up over Greenland and Great. Thank you, Pete, guest speaker, <laughs> unbeknownst to him. Um, so summarized, here are the six different sea level rise, or sea level, yeah, sea level rise values that we'll be looking at. The first is just zero feet.
feet of sea level rise? Are there other, other questions? No. Um, no, I'm just gonna ask the speakers to please repeat the question. Um, and yeah, Pete, hold the mic really close to your mouth if you don't mind. Thank you. Or you're welcome to come sit up here with me if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, storm surge. What is storm surge? A little storm surge 101. So as you all might know, Maine experiences tides about 10 feet on average. Um, it varies depending on where you are throughout the state. And we typically have two high tides and two low tides per day. One of those high tides is usually higher than the other high tide. And Boringly, we call that the higher high tide. <laughs> and we'll talk about that a little bit more after, but keep that in mind, there's a higher high tide. Um, storm surge is the additional water that is on top of your regular tide cycle that you would experience. Storm surge can happen due to high offshore winds pushing the water closer towards shore, which Pete talked about a little bit just now. It could also be less so impacted by, but it could also be impacted by a lower atmospheric pressure, which is essentially just lifting the water up higher. And storm surge, sometimes you'll also see the term still water level. The still water level is just that elevation of water without waves, just a flat elevation of water that is due to your typical tide plus storm surge. So still water levels will be included in this study. And FEMA has provided still water levels for those four storm events that we'll be including. And plus, we'll also be looking at that January 13th storm, and I think that is summarized here on this next slide. So he here we are presenting present day water levels that will be included in this study. There are seven of them. Two of them correspond to just high tides. So a typical higher high tide level and a highest astronomical tide level, or maybe you think of that as a king tide. And then there will be five storm surge still water levels included as part of this study. So as we work down the list, MHHW stands for that mean higher high water. So if you take those higher high tides, that higher tide that you see of the day of the two, and average them over a time period, then you will get a pretty representative value for a water level that you should see every single day. Next, we have the highest astronomical tide. This is the elevation of the highest predicted astronomical tide at a specific tide station. This doesn't include the influence of storms or storm action. This would just be due to um, moon cycles. And without, as I mentioned before, January 13th was that king tide, highest astronomical tide. There also happened to be a storm. So sometimes we just get this without storms. And then we have the five still water elevations. So these are the storm surges on top of your typical tide level, and then also including that max tide that was experienced in January 13th. As you can see, that was almost the level of a 500 year coastal storm event. So then we're gonna take these seven water levels for present day and add sea level rise to each of them, the five other sea level rise scenarios that we previously discussed. And when we put all of this together, we get a table of 42 water levels that we will be looking at as part of this study. But really, 42 water levels is just too much information to digest and really work with. So when we put this table together, you can start seeing that there are water levels that are very similar to each other. So I've highlighted a few of them here. And what this is 
is really showing is that a 50-year storm, a 50-year coastal storm event or a 100-year coastal storm event for today's water levels would be very similar to a high tide event with four feet of sea level rise. So that water level you can get to through a variety of combinations of sea level rise or storm surge. And so we started doing this. We found more groups of levels that were similar and we were able to do this for all of the levels of the 42 and make this 10 different water levels that we would be looking at. That first scenario, scenario one, 7.3 feet in elevation, that represents a highest astronomical tide with 0.8 feet of sea level rise. Anything that would be identified as flooded for that scenario, it would be essentially very low lying, something that is close to the, close to the coast, very low lying, and is experiencing flooding today. Scenario 10 is 16.9 feet, so that represents a 500 year storm event with 7.4 feet of sea level rise. This would be something that is much higher in elevation and typically probably isn't seeing any flooding today. We can generally think of the first few scenarios, anything that would be flooded in the first few scenarios as being near term flood risk, the second group as medium term, and the last several as long term. There is some overlapping there. So shown another way, here's another table. We have also thought about this as the second two, the last two columns are flood risks, flooding that would occur during coastal storm events and when that might happen. So, and then the last column is high tide flooding. So that very first scenario, you would see this water level now during high tide flooding, so highest astronomical flooding, highest astronomical tide or storm events. Those last three scenarios, eight, nine, and 10, you won't see flooding likely until 2100, both during high tide or for coastal storms. But some of these, like scenario five, for example, 10.3 feet, you would likely see flooding in the near term by 2030 during coastal storm events, but you wouldn't see that daily flooding until 2100. And we like to differentiate this because when you start thinking about ad adaptation, um, you would think about adaptation differently for something that will experience flooding every single day or something that may experience flooding once a year. And so that helps us think about how to prioritize infrastructure. Yes. Yes. But yeah, throughout the town, but but it is like can you just repeat the question? Oh yes, sorry. The question is, are we looking at flooding in the town throughout the whole town or just along the coastline? And my answer is that we're looking at flooding throughout the whole town, but only for coastal events. So storm surge or sea level rise, which does propagate up through the town, through the marsh, but flooding, I'll get to this in a little bit. We are not looking at flooding due to rain. Yeah, not from rain. Here we are, what isn't included? Rain. So we have created these 10 water levels to look at and what isn't included in these numbers is flooding due to waves and flooding due to rain events. We do plan on incorporating waves into this study because there are areas in Scarborough that get heavy wave action. That isn't um, represented in just these static water levels. So this is, some people refer to this as bathtub level, so it's just a one level of water. For these areas, Pine Point, Proud Snack, Scarborough Beach, Higgins Beach, we will be using some rules of thumb and some general um, a ranges of wave heights that you might see. I also just wanna mention that there is currently 
a statewide, very sophisticated and detailed coastal model being created that will be looking at wave action, um, including storm events and sea level rise, which is not included in FEMA's flood maps. They don't include sea level rise. So that study, it's a main DOT study. Woods Hole Group is working on it. Maybe it'll be available next year. <laughs> Pete's shaking his head no. <laughs> At some point, it will be available, and that will be a good reference for some more detailed wave modeling analyses. This, as I brought up, is a very planning-oriented broad brush stroke. After infrastructure is identified as wanting to be or should be prioritized for adaptation, the next step in that adaptation process would be to do a wave study at that piece of infrastructure to, to really hone in on what that um, design elevation should be considering waves. So these are my caveats on those aren't included in these levels. Yes. Oh. I just wanted to actually clarify something if it's okay. Yeah. Um, you, for those of you who look at tide charts, you may notice that these numbers are a little bit different from that because the tide charts that we look at are referenced to something called mean low or low water. These are referenced to something called NAVD 88. So then there's about a 4.8 foot difference between those. So, you know, you look at our king tides, they're about 11 point something feet. So just add about four and a half feet roughly to these numbers to get a sense of how, what that would be based on tide chart values. Yeah, that's very helpful. And if you have learned anything from this presentation, then you might guess that mean lower low water is that lowest water level of the two low tides different than mean higher high water, which is the higher level. Tide charts like to have the mean lower low water so that boats know that minimum um, draft that could exist when they're out boating. And hopefully it would be higher than that because it wouldn't be at the lowest point in the tide, but it's helpful to know that lowest point in the tide. Great. <laughs> and Leela, there's a question in the chat. Um, could you explain why rain events aren't uh, being considered in yes. this assessment? So is your mic connected or should I repeat that question? My mic. Okay, great. Um, so rain events are not included in this study mainly because there isn't good existing data in the town of Scarborough on how rainfall corresponds to flood depths or stream heights. And as I'll say again, this is a very broad level study. So we're really compiling existing data. Knowing how rain events and intense rainstorms, how that will translate to flooding will require its own analysis, its own modeling study or, and perhaps to include some water level measurements and streams during rain events. That would be a great thing for the town to do someday. And, but that isn't, unfortunately, we won't be including that as part of this study. Yes. Yeah, so the question is how many inches of rain did we get, what did we get during that major storm? I don't know off the top of my head. Pete also doesn't know. Oh, Elon. Well, let me double check, but I think it was two. Elon thinks it was two, but we're double checking. About two inches, perhaps. I think it was identified as one of um, the, this NOAA, and the National Weather Service compiles a list where they highlight events that are greater than two inches. And I think this was one of those events that was highlighted as greater than two inches. Yeah, uh, it's 2.4. 2.4 inches, and that was for January? January 13th. January 13th, yeah. So it was more than a trifecta. It was, I don't even know what it would be called for four events. <laughs> Uh, so now I just want to give you an idea of everything that will be included in this study that we're looking at for flood risk. We've categorized it in these major categories. 
So transportation, we're looking at roads, rail lines, sidewalks, bridges. We'll be looking at pump stations, buildings, any building that is in the GIS data. But I will say as a caveat, we are not providing specific addresses of buildings that will be at risk. We will be summarizing the number of buildings at risk. And one of the products of this study will be a story map. And I know that you all will open that story map and zoom to where your house is and turn on the flood layer. So you'll be able to get that information of what houses are at risk, but it will not be written down. Um, fire stations, fire hydrants, wells, boat ramps, culverts, beaches. The way that we're looking at beaches is kind of interesting. Um, we thought it would be helpful to understand the width of the beach at high tide and how that will change over the years. Um, most of us know that at high tide, Higgins has very little beach there. And how, you know what might Scarborough Beach look like during high tide in the future? Here is an example of the results. Um, you don't need to be able to see any of these numbers or read anything in this table. I just want to show you what you could expect from the report or looking at the story map in addition to maps that are interactive. This is a summary of some of the public roads in Scarborough. We will be um, summarizing for each of those 10 flood scenarios the length of road that would likely be inundated. So you can get a sense of which I'll tell you the first road, it is Black Rock Road, that in this table would be the most vulnerable, most exposed to flooding. And we'll do this for um, all of that data that we just mentioned. So after we have a sense of what is at risk, for which scenario, we will work on prioritization. So we wanna be able to tell the town here are the heavy hitters, here's what you should focus on for adapting to increase your resilience. So some of the things that we consider for prioritization, first is how exposed to flooding is the asset. So when will it likely see flooding? That is obviously a big factor in this. But really, there are some things that go beyond that. So if it's a road, one of the questions we ask is, are there alternate routes if this road is flooded? Um, could you just easily go around this road? If there are no alternate routes or if the alternate route adds miles and miles, how many people could be impacted if this road, this hypothetical road, is flooded? And then we think about things like, is it an, an emergency route? Is it a pump station that services hundreds of houses? And if that went offline, would that impact a lot of people? So those are the, some of the things that we consider. A lot of times in Maine and more rural places in Maine, we'll see that the end of a dead end road would be flooded, but because it is the end of a dead end road, we're kind of like, don't worry about it. There are other roads that are less exposed to flooding that would have a bigger impact on the community. So we consider many factors. We're near the end. Thank you for bearing with us. So uh, adaptation, I wanna provide a, just a quick summary of how we think about adaptation. This is a figure that's from the International Panel of Climate Change 2019 report that just in an easy way discusses some adaptation options. The first one, so top left, is no response. So this is do nothing. So seas rise, storms get higher, you don't do anything. There's a house or a road or something that is flooded. Maybe someday it gets damaged and then you decide then what you wanna do. Top right, B is advance. This doesn't seem like something you would see and it isn't something that we really do see, but it is something that we have seen in the past. So advance would be you actually build closer to the ocean and get more real estate for developing. This occurred in Portland along Commercial Street. That's all fill, close to Back Cove, that is fill. A lot of coastal communities placed fill and then 
spilt out into the ocean. That is not popular anymore and not something that we will likely recommend for the town. Next up, middle left, we have protection. So this, the idea of this is you build a seawall and you don't move your infrastructure that's at risk, but you prevent the water from getting to it. And then next up, middle right, we have retreat. So this is you move the infrastructure farther away from the flood risk. Next up, bottom left, we have accommodation. So this is you allow the water to go where it wants to go and you elevate yourself or you flood proof so that you're not damaged um, during these new water levels. And then last bottom right, we have ecosystem-based adaptation. So that would be like a living shoreline or green infrastructure. And this is can be helpful in um, reducing wave action as it comes to shore and protecting some of that infrastructure that is inland of the coast. Okay. So next community events. Oh yes, question. Are those channels accessible to us online? These um, adaptation. Well, the whole, the whole series that you've been watching. Yeah, will we, yeah. This will be, this presentation will be made public so you can see everything that you've seen again. So the next uh, community events will actually be neighborhood specific meetings, but they will be open to anybody. The first one will be uh, the Higgins Beach neighborhood meeting. This will be September 5th at 5 p.m. at the Higgins Beach Clubhouse. And then there will be a Pine Point neighborhood meeting September 24th at Pine Point Fire Station. These meetings will not be the same as this. Uh, we won't be diving into as much of the background and um, technical details of this study. We will probably be sharing some neighborhood specific results in that meeting to get us all to start thinking about, you know, what the future of those neighborhoods could look like. Leela, can I just make a correction that I didn't catch earlier when yes. you had me look at these slides? Both of those meetings will actually start at 6 p.m., not at 5 p.m. Okay, great. I have a question. 6 p.m. Is this meeting's videotaped? Yes. If you wanted to share it with the neighborhood to watch to kind of prep for the neighborhood meeting. Yes. So um, this video is, or this presentation is being recorded. Um, we had some issues with the live stream this evening, so it won't be available on the town's YouTube channel until tomorrow, but it will be available tomorrow. You can um, go to the town's YouTube channel and also check um, the town's webpage for this project it can be found under Stay Connected, What's Happening. There's a vulnerability assessment page on the website um, with information including um, slides and notes, I believe, I will double check that, from the work group that is, um, is there's a, a work group of um, residents who are in our coastal neighborhoods that are um, kind of guiding this process. Um, and we're meeting semi-regularly through this process. Yeah, because it would be great to have this slide presentation Yeah, that's a good point. Though, so the question, just to repeat, was will, um, actually, <laughs> What was the question? I think the question was, will this be this presentation be available um, so that it can be shared with people who didn't attend tonight to prep them for these next events? And I will encourage um, sharing of this because it is a long presentation to go over all of this again and then dive into results. So we wanna just talk about results and people who haven't looked at this might have questions which this could answer. So do encourage people to watch this or at least look at the slides. And so next steps, what, I think this is the last slide we have, so what you can expect from this project, there will be an interactive online story map that will be available early next year. So this is something where you can go to to read more about the project and the methods and zoom around and turn on the different scenarios to understand flood risk and learn more about this project. The, the next big thing as part of this project will be selecting some of those pilot projects um, that we will be diving into concept level adaptation plans. We'll be making that selection with the committee through
through the fall and working on that through the fall and winter and early spring. And then this project is slated to be finished by July or maybe the end of July of next year. And that's it. Yes, question. Yes, yeah, so the question is clarification around the term project, and I think this has to do with the last bullet point that the project is finished by July of 2025. So the project, meaning the project with, the current project with GEI, which will be this vulnerability assessment, prioritizing assets, we will be putting together recommend, recommendations for adaptation, but it'll be really high level. So for a road, it could be elevate, it could be relocate, and then general costs, so that broad brush stroke, and then these specific pilot projects, which we'll get a little bit deeper. And then this, this, that will be the conclusion of this project. And the idea is that the town could take the results from this, focus on some of those high prioritized things and take it to that next step of detailed design, getting survey, doing wave analysis, applying for grants um, to start doing this. So it's, it's one of the first steps in a long process towards adaptation. Yes. So the, the question was, how is this vulnerability assessment effort um, related to potential FEMA mitigation funds that the town may be eligible in the future? Basically, we're identifying where our priorities are that, so we can then take that information and apply to FEMA or to other um, sources to start doing some of the, the um, design and implementation in the future. There is a connect, yeah, they are connected. Um, we're certainly not, this, this project wasn't necessarily to get us FEMA money, but it's, it could help us get FEMA money in the future. Um, and we also have a question online, if we can go there. Um, Elise, you can go ahead and unmute. Will the information you're gathering and projecting differentiate beachfront with this wave action compared to, I have a, a house that's behind the Spurwink River at Higgins Beach and we're in an inundation zone. So our vulnerability seems to be different than the um, beach wall homes that um, were severely impacted, but we were also impacted. So will your study differentiate um, give us this, uh, specifics? Yeah, yeah, so we'll be, primarily we will be looking at that inundation that doesn't include wave action, and then for areas where we know wave action occurs right on those coastal Pine Point, Higgins Beach areas, we will be looking into what wave heights you can expect, but as a result of the study, when you go online and, and look at the results, you'll be able to see the areas that have wave action and the areas where the flooding is due to just what the water level is. Thank you. Yes. So Scarborough Sanitary District is kind of a, an independent agency. And are they involved in this? And um, how, I mean, Yes, 
So the question is about the Scarborough Sanitary District, how they are their own entity, not necessarily part of the town, but how they are essential. Their infrastructure is essential um, to the resilience of the town. And how are we including them or how, what is their role in this? And they do have an active role. So they are on, um, one member of the sanitary district is on the oversight committee that's part of this project. And we are, we have met with them um, separately. We are planning on going out to some of the pump stations that are more vulnerable and collecting some field on-site data to really refine what that risk is of a pump station. Pump stations depends on what the pump station is, but some are flood proof to a certain extent. Some, some may become vulnerable once the water is a couple of feet off the ground. And so we want to really get the details of that because like you said, it is a vital piece of infrastructure. And also we are, the wastewater treatment plant is included in this study. So we are looking at how that is impacted. Yes. So the question is about the sewer discharge line at the end of Pearl Street at Higgins Beach and how that has become exposed during because of the storm damage that we've seen this past year and what may happen environmentally if there is more damage to that line. We will not be including damage potential as part of this study. Um, there is a likelihood of increased infrastructure damage due to more storm events, but it's just a little bit outside the scope of this study. Pete. I'm wondering if the, how many pilot projects might occur? And then the second question related to that is, um, are those designs gonna be constrained by existing regulatory mechanisms? Great question. Um, the number of pilot projects isn't decided. It is somewhere on the range of three to five. It really depends on what the scope, once those, those sites haven't been identified, so it will depend on um, what sites they are and the level of effort required for those plans for those identified sites. So that will be a, um, a back and forth process between us and the town. And we will be considering regulatory constraints. Um, we might have to talk to you about some sand dunes. And <laughs> there are a lot of regulations around sand dunes. There are a lot of identified sand dunes in Scarborough, something that we're working with with several towns in Maine right now. So we will be including, we do have a permitting specialist in our office and she will be, we will be engaging her for permitting constraints for any possible adaptation projects. Yes. Could you just summarize those three pilot projects again so we can keep uh, some fresh in our mind? That's a good question. I'd like to put it in context. Yes. So they are not identified yet. Throughout this process, we the idea is that we will look at the results of this we will see that there are some pieces of infrastructure which are heavily at risk, which are vital to the community, and we will say those are good sites for these pilot projects to take it to the next level, which would really set them up for additional funding. Um, and the idea of those pilot projects is that we would dive a little bit deeper in an adaptation, provide about 15% level design plans, um, to position the town to take that forward in a future project, future phase of work. Yes.
most of them would be, it seems like in the winter or spring, like we've had our biggest storms. Is that true? Yes. So, um, Sorry, I didn't repeat the question. The question was around um, the storms that we've been experiencing and how most of them have occurred in winter and spring, and is that true? And my answer was yes, that is typically true. Yes, Pete. I just wanted to add to that. Um, the, the FEMA flood mapping that the town has and just adopted in June? Yep. Uh, models northeaster storm events. Um, but the southeaster events that we did experience in December and then the two storms in January, and then I think we had another one in April. Yeah, <laughs> March, March yeah. and April. Uh, <laughs> um, we're all southeasters. But uh, some initial comparisons between flooding outlined in the FEMA flood maps and the flooding experienced on January 13th, which was a southeaster, were very, very similar. So we do have a good proxy already of the potential impacts from existing storm events. So I just wanted to add that to the conversation. Yes. Um, this may just dovetail on the back of what she was asking here, that we're concerned about these winter and spring storms, but also we understand warming waters and hurricanes and how much of this preparation of this or this planning um, takes into the effect or the account that we could have a significant Yes, so the question is around how the last question was about how the storms we're seeing are in winter and spring, and the, this question was, are we also going to be considering storms that could occur in the summer months? And so now I'm gonna give a little bit of background on how FEMA derives their storm surge levels, those still water elevations that we're looking at. So they use this process where they take hypothetical storm scenarios from many different directions and strengths and model them along the coastline. And so this could be nor well, this is not this is not going against what Pete said. What Pete said is also true about how they're looking at nor'easters. Um, but for those still water levels, they are um, looking at a variety of different storm directions and creating, doing statistics to say that 1% level due to all these different types of scenarios could, would be here. Once they take those still water levels and then put them, and then, this is getting deeper into FEMA than you probably need, but here we are. Once you have those still water levels um, due to storms and then you basically put that towards the coastline um, with wind onshore wind headed towards the coastline. You calculate wave setup, wave run up, and you get a value. That is typically more that nor'easter event after that water level has been decided. However, that still water level that we're using, there is plenty of room for improvement on that in the world of climate science and we're just not there yet. So those are really the best levels that we have to work with. Yes. Considering things like that, uh, seasonal, uh, seasonal mitigation uh, approaches. 
Yeah, so the question is around how the main DEP often regulates what can be done in terms of adaptation along the coastline, so where you could put a wall, where you could elevate a structure, and that is true. Um, and then followed up with that was how they're um, looking in some places at putting temporary structures, like temporary flood barriers, for instance, at Scarborough Beach, and are we looking at that in this study? And the answer is we will be talking about temporary actions that can be taken. Um, I also want to just highlight, and Pete might know more about this, but I have been told that as part of this, um, this f funding that the state recently received, I think from NOAA, about looking at coastal flood risk and resiliency, they, we will be diving into, not we, GEI, but the state as a whole, some of the regulatory considerations for these projects and maybe looking at it with a new light. So maybe there could be some changes to the regulations in terms of coastal adaptation. So that will all be, I don't know when that would occur, but we will definitely be following along with that because a lot of um, what we, may think about recommending or what might come to mind would likely not be allowed due to, to existing regulations. Um, so yes, we will be looking at what's regulated and temporary options as well. Yes. Um, one example I, that I'd like to ask Pete about is the uh, uh, long scope natural ways of growing to do, and which seems like something that the DEP and all of us would, would like. And so would recommendations like that become important? Uh, I'm, I'm going to assume so, <laughs> um, because uh, the, the activities within the highly regulated coastal sand dune system along uh, big portions of, of Scarborough's shoreline um, are limited to certain activities that you can and cannot do. So um, dune restoration and, you know, dune construction, I'm assuming, is one of those ecosystem-based alternatives that GEI will be looking at. Um, and there are certainly areas where, in town, where dune restoration would make a lot of sense. I'm going to do a last call for questions to folks online. If anyone has anything, feel free to put it in the chat or raise their hand. I'll also do last call for questions in the room. Seems like we're petering out a little bit. Um, oh. Is that, uh, yeah, one other, one last question. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll quickly summarize that. The comment is around how um, uh, we're excited that this is happening and concerned that action needs to, appreciative that this is happening and concerned that we need to take action more immediately because 
erosion is happening, storms are happening, we're already seeing that damage. Yeah, it would be great if uh, many communities in Maine did studies like this years ago. Um, it's all developing. Like the main, for example, Maine Climate Council sea level rise recommendations came out four years ago for the first time. Um, that does seem like a while ago, but you know we were as engineers working in this field without specific recommendations and so using data on our own. Um, so it is, it is all still in development. And one of the reasons for this broad brush stroke study is because we can get a lot of information in a relatively short time frame so that projects can be identified and advanced um, from there. If you do look at one site and do a detailed study, it can take a long time. So we want to, we're, we're trying to do this as fast as we can. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is the town doing to supplement a study? So the town is working on a number of town infrastructure projects. So um, Leela mentioned at the beginning of the meeting that we are working with DOT to do a study of Route 1 and Route 9 where they cross the marsh. Those are chronic flood points. Um, the town also partnered with um, Cape Elizabeth to um, get funding to actually do a road removal project um, through the Spurwink Marsh um, of a chronically flooding road. So um, the, the town is looking at kind of our larger and critical infrastructure pieces. And as Leela mentioned, and has been mentioned a number of times this evening, the sewer is a concern. And so we are working with Scarborough Sanitary District so that we can make sure that um, the, our wastewater system, our public wastewater system remains functional during these events and in the case. A separate work stream happening. For sure, yeah, there are, there are, but the thing is, there's a lot that needs to happen. And I think that what Leela has conveyed tonight, especially if you think about the chart with all of those roads where she said you don't need to know what those roads are right now, that's only a portion of the roads. We've got a lot of vulnerabilities in Scarborough, both public infrastructure and private structures and private properties. Um, and it can be really overwhelming. So we have started addressing things that we know are issues because Route 1 has flooded probably four times. We've had to shut Route 1 four times in the past two years, at least, maybe more than that. Um, so those are kind of the ones that we definitely know about. And then we need to be thinking, what are the ones that we haven't considered yet? Um, and then, as Leela mentioned, and they're kind of um, pulling together a timeline of when we can probably expect flooding to happen because of sea level rise and what we may expect um, in the interim with, with storms and things like that. So we need to be methodical. We don't, the town doesn't have unlimited resources. Everybody in this room knows that. And so we are trying to do this in a way where we can plan for what's coming at us. Um, so we're trying to do, implement things as, they're, as we know about them and as opportunities arise, and then looking more long-term and uh, trying to understand what funding is available. Fortunately, there is a lot of resiliency funding available right now um, through uh, FEMA and NOAA and things like that. So we are setting ourselves up um, to be able to go after some of that funds and start addressing other, other sites throughout town, but there's a lot. So it's gonna be a bit of a process. Yeah, so I, I'm just going to reiterate that that um, that you appreciate the uh, that there's other other work happening. We also need to recognize that the town's not alone in this. We're we work with partners. A lot of the roads that are are having flooding issues, they're state roads. So we really need to work closely with Maine DOT um, and get on their work plan. Um, and so we were fortunate to be able to push Route 1 and Route 9 because that wasn't necessarily on their radar until the town came to them and said, hey, our, our plow trucks were plowing chunks of ice off of Route 1. Can we like move this up higher in the queue? We really, this is an essential 
um, corridor in Scarborough and for the region. And fortunately, they're working with us. Um, and hopefully, you know, we'll have preliminary designs, hopefully this fall is what we're being told. Um, construction is still a couple years off, but that project's moving forward faster than it would have been if we weren't plowing chunks of ice off of Route 1 um, on the Martin Luther King storm in 2022. Yes, question over here. Uh, what's the best way for residents to report areas of vulnerability that may not be coming to your attention because they don't affect a whole lot of people, but yet they're still vulnerable areas? What's the best mechanism to report that? So the question is how to provide feedback to, um, to this process for areas that may not be captured um, through the analysis that Leela and her team are doing. Leela, if you, how are sure. you gonna initiate This that? is um, not necessarily part of this project, but I heard Jamie mention that the town is partnering with GMRI on, on community science initiative. That is a really excellent way to provide data yourself. So they have a platform where you'll be able to go out during a storm event or a period of high tide, take a photo, write some observations, and it all gets compiled into one place online. So that, um, I know GMRI will be doing a big push this fall, September or October, on their community science. They will be hosting some webinars to go over that process and discuss um, how you can do that as a community member. So I would recommend that as a great avenue. That's not part of this project, that's separate. Um, taking, fo yeah, taking photos um, is always immensely helpful so that we can really see where flooding occurs. And we'll have to discuss, separate from community science, where where we could compile those photos and how. Well, and also just related to this process, I will say when the story map comes out and um, you're able to take a look at that, look closely at the areas that you're, you're concerned about to make sure that they are captured. And if they're not, reach out um, to me um, so that we can you know, work with GEI to either understand why maybe it wasn't um, included. Um, hopefully it will be. Like, like Leela has explained, this is going, this is a fairly exhaustive process. Even though it is high level and broad brush, um, they are looking townwide. Um, obviously the, the focus is on the coast, but Scarborough's coast is very big because of the marsh and, um, in inland areas are impacted as well. So, um, so yeah, once the information is available for you to look at, please please spend some time and take a look at it and, and give us the feedback um, if we did miss anything. I saw you had your hand up first over here, yeah. Yeah, I, um, I can only speak about the intention of Byron, but I wanted to support the idea of the importance of um, putting the importance on the sewer system. And I know from being here in January, and I know from talking to the services folks about what they're doing and they're doing with it, and I know from one of the subsequent services meetings that the pumping station on Chandler Street failed and didn't work in. And they had pumping trucks down there for weeks to just try and keep the sewer level. You know, so that's how that's how urgent it was. And they reported at the meeting after the storm that thirty thousand Yeah, so the question is about how the sewer district is vital and is important. The sewer, dis the S Scarborough Sanitary District is actively participating in this project. And we developed as, as part of this process, one, um, one day of collecting actually going, we're using LIDAR data for this project. So available online data of ground elevation, but for our one day of actually getting out there and taking measurements of on-site, we are doing pump stations because we recognize that that is one of the most vital pieces of infrastructure in the town.
So I, I will just mention also that Scarborough Sanitary District is run by a board of Scarborough residents. So if in their meetings are all open to the public. So while they are a separate entity from the town, um, you are their constituents. So um, you are welcome to go to their um, regular trustees meetings um, and hear about the, their, their business. Um, and also to share your um, what concerns that you have and hear about what resiliency plans they may have um, coming in the future. Um, Leela has mentioned that they um, are engaged in this process. We are working with them. Um, and I encourage any of you, I mean, they have openings from time to time. So you are welcome to run as a Scarborough Sanitary District uh, trustee um, if you would like to um, kind of help guide and um, provide direction to that organization. Yes, behind you, Deb. Yeah. Yes, uh, Gulf of Maine Research Institute or GMRI hosts coastal meetups um, to help promote their community science initiatives. So the town is um, organizing, working with Gulf of Maine Research Institute to organize a coastal meetup. So that is separate from this vulnerability assessment, but definitely related. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, ours is um, August 22nd um, at 2 p.m. We are meeting at the Pine Point Eastern Trail parking lot. And that will kind of teach you how to collect the data and um, submit it to, uh, to GMRI as, um, to show changing tides over time. Yes. I have a comment and a request. The comment relates to GMRI. That I understand NOAA has a water level gauging program, but I believe GMRI now has one at Pine Point, and this community might be very interested in having access to that data point. They can watch live what the water level is. And my request is that whoever the town perhaps um, could provide identity to the citizens of some survey data points as to how they relate to the NAEDAD data. Perhaps I, I know there's a, a bolt on a telephone pole that the top of that bolt is a known place, but it's only known to the surveyors. If that can be known to the public, then we might be able to more easily judge our own property or our neighbor's property to see what our immediate so the comment is around um, a new water level gauge at uh, in Scarborough and about datums and converting um, chart data mean low, low water to NABD 88, which is what we're using here and what you'll see in FEMA flood insurance maps are NABD 88. And often now when you get a survey at your site, it will be in NABD 88 and that is different from the chart. Um, so the Water level monitor is called a Hohonu tide station. And that is very exciting that it is here. Um, you can go online to their website and see those uh, water level measurements since an up-to-date time and projections for, they do this for most stations. I guess I should have checked if they're doing that for Scarborough. I think they are, but projections for water levels um, for tides in the future. So we can provide a link to how you can see that yourself. Um, you can compare that to the Portland NOAA tide gauge. Um, we'll probably provide a, some sort of summary of comparison in our report uh, between those two different tide gauges. And when you go to their website, you can have that data um, provided in that mean lower low water datum, or you could have it provided within NAVD 88 datum, so you can compare that water level to the projections from this study. And we can also summarize, we usually do this for most of our reports, that datum, that datum um, comparison between mean lower low water and NAVD 88, somewhere around four and a half feet, we can give you that exact value. So I don't believe that the link to the 
uh, tide gauge that is installed at the Pine Point Pier has been posted on the town's website yet, but I will make sure that it goes onto the vulnerability assessment page so you can link through there. Um, if you are interested in seeing kind of our very specific Scarborough um, tide data, which does tend to be a little bit different from um, what is shown for the Portland Tide Station. Um, I also wanna mention, we are in the process of getting high watermark signs. Um, that's on me. I'm very delinquent in getting those signs posted, but we do have them um, ready to um, be posted in various locations around Scarborough. Um, and they are showing the water level from the blizzard of 78. Um, I think we're gonna have new high water levels. So after the, the January 13th storm. Um, but yeah, that is, um, that is a, a project that I've been delinquent on working on, self-admittedly. Um, Leela, I do wanna say, ask, uh, there's one other question that was asked online. Will building dikes be considered as an adaptation? Yes, yeah, so dikes, the purpose of dikes are often to break up wave action headed towards shore. Probably we won't be looking at dikes as I think about it now. We often look at the infrastructure on land. Um, sometimes seawalls are referred to as dikes, in which case perhaps we will be looking at that. So my general answer would be yes, that that would be considered. Um, probably the, just thinking about the Scarborough coastline, it would be very heavily regulated to build a dike. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the 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 comment was on how there are um, infrastructure. There's infrastructure you can put offshore to break up wave action. Yes. So staggered. staggered yeah. So it could be um, an artificial reef system to help attenuate those waves and. Certainly, there are um, measures that you can take to attenuate wave, wave action. We will likely summarize that in our report. That won't impact that just static water level, standing water level, that, that flooding that is caused even without wave action. So there will be most, this study will primarily focus on that static water level, but we will identify some areas of heavy hitting wave action. Any other questions online? Um, nope, uh, nothing specific for this evening. There was a request to po post information about um, the coastal meetup on August 22nd. Um, and there is, um, if you go to the, the town's website or the town's Facebook page, there is information in both of those locations. Um, in the website, it's under the news, and on the Facebook page, it's um, there's an, been a, an event created for um, the coastal meetup on the 22nd. Anything else? Yeah. I guess I can thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody, for coming. All right, so stay tuned for more information to come in this process, and um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Feel free to reach out to me, um, Jamie Fitch, Sustainability Coordinator, with other questions that we may not have gotten to this evening, um, and we look forward to engaging with you all in the future on this some more. <laughs>